My name is Mark Orlando, um, and this is the abridged Building a Sock A Team. Um, we're having some uh, some AV issues, so while we work through those, I'm just going to kick it off and start talking. Um, so just use your imagination. The slides are amazing. Um, so by way of introduction, um, again, my name is Mark Orlando. I've got uh, about 17 years um, in security operations of all flavors, public sector, private sector. Uh, I've built 24 by 7 operations teams. I've worked at managed security service providers really all across the board. Uh, I'm an 80s kid, hence the uh, references to the A-Team, the true A-Team. I don't know what that movie was a couple years ago, but uh, we're not going to be talking about that. Um, couple quick notes about this talk. So um, I wanted to give a talk about the people aspect of security operations. Um, we're not going to be talking about technology here. Um, to some extent, I, I firmly believe that that's, that's interchangeable. Uh, lots of good tech out there. The good people um, are the ones that are... Uh, so you have to switch back to the other, the other console. The other Mac. Or can I put my Mac in now? Yeah, let's do your Mac. All right. So, um, you know, good people are hard to find. Uh, they're hard to train. They're really hard to retain. And, uh, you know, I think if you're going to build a SOC A team or an A team of any kind, uh, the people are really kind of the foundation of what you're doing. So that's what this talk is about today. If I can get my slides up. So now we're pushing back? Yeah, because well, someone messed up. There's a different situation now. I might have to go back. Oh, okay. That might be an HDCP, HDCP issue. That's why I bypassed it for that one. Now we're going to go back. Okay. I didn't know that. It didn't work on this one either. That's why we switched it originally. There Boom. you go. There we go. So whatever you did works. No, it's not going over there. Well, it's... Okay. So how many of you actually watched the original A-Team show? We got some young people in the audience, so I couldn't be too, too sure. All right, so at the beginning of the show, you know, if you have a problem, if you have to find the people that you need, right? Um, these are some of the problems that you're going to have to worry about. All right, the first thing is a lack of really, it says business alignment, but it should be organizational alignment. I think that's one of the biggest challenges in security operations is you have people defending environments where they really don't know exactly what they're defending. Um, how do you create value? How do you protect that value? Data and tools, you know, too much or too little. Um, an outdated alert watcher model. Uh, firmly believe that the root of a lot of this talk of talent shortages and analyst fatigue and a lot of the other issues that plague security operations comes down to uh, this concept that we need to fill a room with people and point them at screens and have them do that day in and day out. You know, humans are not built for that kind of activity. So this alert watcher kind of watchstander model um, has to change. You're not going to build an A team based on that. Um, and so I kind of mentioned this, you know, is there really a talent shortage? Um, I don't believe that there is. I mean, just look around the events of the last couple of days. There's talent everywhere, right? Our problem is that we're having trouble meeting in the middle between what I need as a business owner and what I'm actually going to find out there in the market and how I'm going to find that talent and um, promote that talent, retain it, train the people to do kind of what I need them to do. Um, I don't think there's a shortage of people out there. I think there's a shortage of reasonable expectations. I think that's the real problem. Um, so if we're going to build our SOC A team, um, you know, really there are a couple key things that, that we need to do. And any of you that watch the show know that, you know, we have a small group of uh, former U.S. soldiers that were really kind of jacks of all trades, whether it's infiltrating, you know, a terrorist cell or uh, welding together, you know, a crazy like bulldozer in a barn or, you know, whatever it is, they could kind of do it all, right? So that's the kind of team that I'm talking about um, in cyber operations. The first thing we need to do is study our mission, study our business. So if you're building a SOC or you have a SOC and you can't pick any one person out of the team and ask them to explain what it is that the organization really does, whether it's manufacturing widgets and selling them or offering public services or taking care of people or whatever it is, if they don't understand how the organization is creating value, I would argue that they're ill-equipped to make good decisions on any given day about how to protect that, that enterprise. Um, we need to be ready to experiment and iterate. 
right? So a lot of times we don't have that luxury in security operations, right? We have very specific things that we have to get done on any, any given day. But I would argue if you're not able to kind of experiment and try different things, if you're not able to look back on the past week and the past month and the past year and see what's working and what's not and be ready to change that up, um, you're, you're really not going to be able to do all the things that you need to do. If you're a leader or a manager in security operations, you know, you may not be um, at the point where you can get back on the keyboard um, or, you know, work a shift or offer up, you know, the technical guidance. Maybe you're, you're past that or maybe that's just not your skill set. But at the very least, you know, be ready to be in there with, uh, you know, a bunch of pizzas on a holiday to support your team. Be ready to get into the trenches with them. Uh, finally, we're going to talk, if I talk really fast, we're going to talk about metrics and showing results. So security operations, in my experience, is a very opaque kind of activity. And leadership, particularly executive leadership of, of most organizations, don't fully understand what goes on on any given day in security operations because that's, you know, that's not their background, that's not their skill set. So if you can't communicate what you're doing in a meaningful way to that leadership, um, guess what? Your sock's probably not going to last very long. You're probably not going to be able to do all the cool experimentation and things that you want to do. And then finally, you know, as Hannibal would say on the A-team, you got to have a plan. And the plan when you're building a security operations center is not to build a security operations center. That is a means to an end. So what's your plan for actually helping to make your organization, your enterprise, your agency, whatever it is, more secure? Okay. Um, in the past, uh, and this is kind of generalizing a bit, but really there are two approaches to building out SOC teams, right? There's what I refer to as the talent-centric model, or if I'm being less kind, the, the rock star model where you find one really skilled, experienced person and you kind of build the team around them. And the team sort of takes direction and leadership from uh, that one skilled person or those, those few key people. The second option is more of a mission-centric approach. Um, you see this a lot in DOD or the federal government where it's like we have a shared mission. I'm just going to bring in a bunch of resources kind of in short order, maybe a new contract, something like that. And we're all just going to be focused on executing you know, these specific functions day in and day out. The challenge with the talent-centric approach um, is, you know, even though you might have more capability faster because you're bringing in really experienced people and they're going to be able to kind of bring the rest of the team along, your capacity is really going to be limited to, to those few key people, right? And if they leave um, or if they're out um, or if they bring certain biases to the job, which, you know, human nature, the more we're in a role, the more we're going to kind of bring our own biases into it, the more we're going to start to hyper-specialize. So those biases and that special specialization is going to bleed into the rest of the team. Conversely, with that mission-centric approach, you might be better aligned to the organization, um, but you might be a little bit less flexible, um, be a little bit less willing to try different things and iterate and experiment and go outside of that predefined lane. Um, and you kind of run the risk a lot of times of missing the forest for the trees. So not making kind of more discrete observations about what you're seeing, maybe new threats, new trends, um, you know, kind of issues with the process as it stands might be a little bit less likely to identify those as everyone is kind of focused on just executing a set of predefined steps. So how do we kind of strike the happy medium between that talent-centric approach? We all want talented, skillful people, um, but also being mission-aligned and mission-focused. Um, you need to look for the right attitude and aptitude. You got to have diversity of thought. So that means people with different backgrounds, people with different skill sets, right? Um, you want to avoid over-reliance on experience and certifications. I know we all um, have opinions about certifications and credentials. They can be really good things, right? But we don't want to rely on those as indicators of skill, of course. Um, and I probably don't need to say anything about egos and misrepresentation. You know, we kind of want to stay away from that. Um, a few keynotes, and, and I'm going to kind of step through these quickly. Um, when you're working, um, whether it's junior staff or senior staff, um, there are a lot of things that I think people don't take into account um, with some of these staffing models. I've seen a lot of operations teams staff up really fast on very junior talent. Maybe they've got a good pipeline from like a university or other sort of feeder resource. Um, and everyone's thrilled, right? Because we're able to get some really uh, talented, motivated staff and, you know, uh, compensation is usually a little bit lower. And so we look as that, at that, and business owners especially look at that as a win, right? But we don't think about in the out years, 
you know, these people are going to get really smart. They're going to build up that experience very quickly. And so we need to plan for additional investments in that team in relatively short order. So that means we need to be, you know, right-sizing salaries to be competitive in the market. We need to be making investments in training, uh, have a long-term career growth path, right? If you're not willing to provide those things in years two and three and the out years, um, you're going to have a big problem. And all the time and resources and energy you've put into those junior resources is going to walk right out the door to another security team. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, with senior staff, and I put asterisks here because um, I'm grossly overgeneralizing here, um, but by and large, you know, compensation is going to be higher. Um, there's going to be probably a little bit less flexibility or at least more hyper-specialization that tends to happen, you know, the further down the, the path um, operators get. And so, um, you know, I find it's more useful sometimes to try to look within the organization to bring in those senior resources. Maybe it won't be in some of the specific technology or disciplines that you're looking for. Um, but there will be a lot of, um, you know, work experience, uh, technical experience, you know, finding those good fishing holes. I'll talk about this in a second. Um, you know, talent begets talent. So if you're staffing your team with more skilled, more experienced resources, uh, chances are they've also worked with other skilled, experienced people, right? So how can you tap into those fishing holes, make hires, you know, two, three, four at a time, if at all possible? I've had a lot of success doing that. Okay. When we talk about training, you know, I think in our, in our industry, uh, there tends to be a lot of focus on classroom training and textbook training and tool training. And I think all of those things are great. But I think sometimes they come at the cost um, of training our, our operators and our analysts, our investigators in you know, the right way to think, uh, the right way to ask questions, the right investigative mindset. I'll, I'll uh, share some examples from Chris Sanders. I don't know if any of you have, have read um, or seen Chris talk or, or read of any, of any of what he's written. He talks a lot about analyst mindset and the right way of thinking. Those things are a lot harder to train someone to do. So I would say whether you're recruiting or whether you're putting together a training program, focus on those things first. Um, the other stuff, you know, how to write queries, how to use tools, you know, those things can, can be taught relatively easily, or at least there are a lot more resources out there where you can kind of outsource that. You know, focus more on the, the kind of analytic skills. Right. Um, I did want to include... Um, before the time's up here, talking about measuring operations, because this is one another area I think that we don't spend a lot of time on. But again, in my experience, um, it really comes down to the difference between a high-performing team and a team that's kind of proven itself over and over in an organization and one that is really subject to you know changes in kind of corporate direction or, or what have you, really subject to um, external factors that, that may or may not benefit the team. So KPIs, I think a lot of us have heard about key performance indicators. Those are you know, how you measure kind of day-to-day -day operations. Um, less popular in what we do is a concept of um, objectives and key results. So this is where we tie what we're doing day to day in the SOC to larger business objectives. So talking about that organizational alignment, this is really kind of how we, we make sure that that happens. Um, sample KPIs. Uh, anyone who's done SOC work probably recognizes these kinds of things, right? Well, what's our visibility? You know, how many investigations are we working on any given day? What's our average close rate? What's our average time to discovery, time to remediate, things like that. Those are all KPIs. OKRs are more things like, you know, where are we trying to get to with our team, right? Are we trying to reduce successful attacks? Um, we're trying to reduce... Um, you know, kind of average time that our team is taking to, to close out cases. And there can be some overlap here, um, but I think it's important to keep those strategic and business goals in mind as well and be tracking those over time just as much as you're doing uh, kind of the more tactical KPIs, right? Um, we also, I think, overlook often measuring people, right? So in the A-team, right, there was no question that they were all rock stars. They were all awesome, right? That's why the show was so entertaining. That's why they always were, were successful by the end of every episode. But, you know, how do we measure our people day to day um, where it's, you know, maybe a little less glamorous, right? And it can be difficult to measure people because you run the, run the risk of reducing, um, you know, what is really quite complicated job to... Um, you know, numbers and ratings and things like that. And, and we really don't want to do that. So uh, I included a couple really good resources here, including um, an analyst baseball card. Chris Crowley uh, kind of came up with this concept. And I think it's a, a good way to come up with good kind of measures of how effective uh, and contributive an analyst on the team is. Um, 
And we use that, you know, not to penalize, but to kind of identify where our people can improve, where they're doing well, um, you know, things like that. So I, I think that's a, a great resource. Um, I've got a link to this as well. Okay. But the bottom line is, you know, talent can be found in lots of different places. I think most of us know that. Um, we all come from, from different backgrounds. But, you know, understanding how to identify it, how to foster it, how to retain it, um, you know, that's really the key challenge. And I think... Um, we really have to get away from that alert watcher, that watchstander mindset, and think about you know how we're improving over time. How are we you know drawing a line in the sand and kind of moving the sock forward, both as a team, as a full sock capability, and individually? How are we helping people grow? Um, so, um, I think the difference between an A team and, and kind of all the other teams out there uh, is really cohesion and measurable results. So every team that I've built or run or managed, um, you know, they're able to point to kind of real tangible impacts in the organization, thinking about how the organization um, generates value and how they're protecting that and enabling that versus, well, you know, we, we do a bunch of stuff. We got all these tools. They generate alerts. We look at those. Um, you know, I think really that's, that's the wrong mindset, the wrong model. Um, I was going to include some case studies. Uh, I'm sure these slides will be out there. I don't think we have time to go through those. Um, but, you know, some key lessons in here. Learn how to tell, tell the story. Um, if you've discovered kind of how to um, tie what you're doing to that business value, learn how to tell that in a narrative way and learn how to repeat it early and often to your leadership. Um, being in a SOC and running a SOC is as much a sales job as anything. So I've got some other resources for you. You know, really anything that um, uh, is in, you know, SANS, SEC 450 on the blue team. Uh, MITRE's written some really good work, obviously, on security operations. Uh, the 10 strategies for, for good security operations is a little dated at this point, but still really good resource. Um, and just some, some kind of food for thought. And I think that uh, we're about out of time. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.